Welcome to Trauma Periocular Structures, Eyelid Lacerations, Orbital Fracture, and Retrobulbar Hematoma. This video lecture assumes that you have completed the lecture addressing assessment of the eye trauma patient. All photos are from the AAO website. During this lecture, we will present common manifestations of eyelid lacerations, orbital fractures, and retrobulbar hematomas, also known as hemorrhages. We will discuss the initial management of each of these clinical scenarios, as well as the timeline, urgency of referral to an ophthalmologist or ophthalmic subspecialist. With eyelid lacerations, there is usually a history of trauma, either blunt or lacerating. The patient may have associated pain, tearing, or bleeding. And lid lacs are oftentimes associated with other eye injuries. So it is very important to do a full assessment of the patient to rule out concurrent hyphema, orbital fracture, and especially open globe. A lid lac should never be repaired until an open globe has been addressed. Consider a non-contrast CT scan of the brain in orbits if there's a penetrating injury, especially if you observe orbital fat in the wound or there's a history of severe blunt trauma. The CAT scan can be used to evaluate for concurrent fracture, retained foreign body, or intracranial injury. If an intraorbital foreign body is suspected, imaging should be obtained prior to wound closure of the lid lac so that the foreign body can be removed before the wound is closed. Update the patient's tetanus if indicated, and if the wound is contaminated or there is a suspected or identified foreign body, consider using broad spectrum oral antibiotics, especially in the setting of human or animal bites. No matter how tempting, never remove tissue, even if it looks necrotic or beyond repair. Prior to anticipated repair, keep the lacerated skin moist. This can be accomplished by copiously covering the wound with ophthalmic erythromycin ointment and then Immediate referral of the lid lac patient to an oculoplastic specialist, which is an ophthalmologist who is specially trained in eyelid repair, is indicated in the following scenarios. Involvement of the lid margin, which is the end of the eyelid where the lashes insert, or full thickness lac, which means it's going completely through the eyelid from anterior to posterior, or if there's obvious involvement of the canalicular or tear drainage system, or if the medial one-third of the upper or lower eyelid is involved which is associated with a higher probability of canalicular involvement. Or, if there is fat prolapsing into the wound, this indicates violation of the orbital septum and requires meticulous repair. And lastly, if there is significant loss of tissue, which may require a skin graft or pedicle flap. Next, we will discuss orbital fractures. There is usually a history of blunt trauma, such as a sports injury with falls, equipment, or extremities hitting the orbit, or a punch or fist to the face, or a fall, or airbag deployment. Patients with orbital fractures may present with blurry, decreased, or double vision. Sometimes they note difficulty moving the eye or pain with eye movement. There may be bruising or swelling of the eyelid skin. The patient may note numbness of the cheek, upper lip, or teeth on the involved side, this can occur if there is injury to the infraorbital nerve from a floor fracture. There may be bulging or sinking of the eye depending on the size of the fracture and whether there is blood or air behind the eye. And there may even be air underneath the skin on the affected side, something called orbital crepitus or subcutaneous emphysema. Fractures of the orbit can involve any of the four walls or a combination, but fractures of the floor and medial walls are the most common. Orbital fractures are also associated with other eye injuries, including hyphema and lid lacs, so a full examination of the eye to rule out concurrent eye injuries should be done. On physical exam, pay special attention to any limitations in eye movement. As pictured here, you may recognize this patient from other cases. She's had this fracture forever. Limitation of eye movement may indicate entrapment of the extraocular muscle. Check for diminished sensation of the cheek on the injured side which may indicate injury to the infraorbital nerve in the setting of a floor fracture, a bubble wrap quality of the eyelid skin, which may indicate subcutaneous emphysema, or a step-off deformity of the orbital rim. A non-contrast CAT scan of the orbit and brain should be obtained for all suspected fractures. It is a, if a head CT is ordered and an orbit fracture is noted, a follow-up orbit CT should be obtained. Once an orbit fracture is identified, initial management depends on which walls are involved. 
If the fracture involves the floor or medial wall, these are adjacent to aerated sinuses, sinus precautions should be prescribed. These include use of nasal decongestant, broad spectrum antibiotics, and the avoidance of nose blowing or sneezing, as these can introduce air into the orbit and result in orbital emphysema. If the fracture involves the roof, cripiform plate, frontal sinus, or is associated with intracranial injury, a neurosurgical consultation should be obtained. If the orbit fracture is associated with other facial fractures, such as maxillary sinus, nasal bone, or CMC fracture, consider consultation with oral maxillofacial surgeons or ENT specialists. Patients with orbital fractures should be emergently referred to an oculoplastic specialist if the patient is an adult with clinical evidence of muscle entrapment. Be careful with pediatric patients with orbital fractures as they can present with white-eyed blowout fracture of the orbital floor. These kids generally do not have any bruising or swelling of the eyelids, but may have bradycardia, heart block, nausea, vomiting, or syncope if the inferior rectus is entrapped. Such patients need repair within 24 to 48 hours of injury. Lastly, we'll discuss retrobulbar hematomas or hemorrhages. There is usually a history of recent trauma, and this includes surgery to the eye and or orbit. A retrobulbar hemorrhage is considered an ophthalmic emergency that can lead to permanent vision loss from orbital compartment syndrome. The patient with a retrobulbar hematoma may present with pain, decreased vision, and inability to open their eyelids due to severe swelling, a bulging or tense eye, or a diffuse subconjunctival hemorrhage or congested conjunctival vessels. Check an Check on intraocular pressure if equipment to do so is available. If you do not have access to an IOP measuring device, palpate the eye for resistance to retropulsion. If the eye feels harder than the fellow eye, the IOP is likely quite elevated. If your clinical suspicion is high enough for a retrobulbar hemorrhage, then a canthotomy cantholysis should be performed immediately. Do not wait for the results of imaging studies to confirm your clinical suspicion, and do not wait for consultation with an ophthalmologist. These delays may result in permanent vision loss. If a canthotomy cantholysis cannot be performed for some extraordinary reason, lower the intraocular pressure medically with eye drops and or intravenous acetazolamide or mannitol. Once a canthotomy cantholysis is performed, the patient should immediately be referred to an ophthalmologist. The patient may require additional maneuvers if their IOP does not respond or if active hemorrhaging causes a recurrence of orbital compartment syndrome. The patient will be, need to be closely monitored by ophthalmology until IOP and vision is stabilized. Thank you for using this educational video. Please let us know if you have any comments or questions.